Betty. Streamer here with airplanes, bugs, flowers, cars, people, guitars, little bits and pieces of this and that. Then they are those spiders, birds, crawfish, ducks, city streets, buildings, lakes, and trees. What do you think it all means? Soap opera, what? Soap opera, villains, heroes, body works, weird visual stuff, weird oral stuff, music, water, rocks, flying saucers, UFOs, street festivals, confetti, 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 confetti. 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 I like to be a troublemaker, but... <laughs> um, no, actually, in fact, I like it. Uh, last, the last week in the department, hey, what do you say you get to the panel? Well, I'm not going to talk about my work. I can't talk about my work. This is always a big issue with artists. Um, as a matter of fact, I'd like to talk about my work. That's why I'm a troublemaker. And uh, although I think that in the long run, the visual thing, whatever it is, does stand on it on its own and needs to. That what happens when you get together in a group like this is the energy that you generate by discussing it in front of it and among each other can be very exciting. And that's of course why I'm not teaching. So uh, I do like to talk because I think it does generate more thought, more talk, you know, ideas. The other thing that comes up is Mike says to me. Shall I talk about the form or shall I talk about the content? And uh, usually painters like to talk about the form or the process. Image makers like to talk about, you know, how it gets made. Roy just did a great thing about, you know, about the chance element in his process. And I think that's really fascinating. And if you were to ask me how much time I spent on what parts of the, of the work, I probably spent the most time on the form trying to make the shapes of the figures and the decorative elements, uh, the bridges, the eyes, fit into and respond to the shapes of the, the, uh, the uh, panels. Uh, or particularly this group of work, working on the color, trying to make it resonate in a certain way. <coughs> what I'm really going to talk about is the content. That's also usually unpopular. Uh, because for me, I'm interested in that kind of gap between words and images. And I really like what happens in stories that take place both in words and images. And so I thought what I would do is to tell you a little bit about what this means to me and also to tell you how it got there. So it's something about the creative process. Um, but before I do, I want to make sure that you know that in some ways it wouldn't matter to me if you didn't come tonight and you didn't hear me say this. And whatever you thought or saw when you looked at the work is perfectly valid. So it doesn't depend on what I'm going to tell you, but I entertain all these really strange ideas, and I thought you might like to know what they are. Uh, first of all, the issue of the siren and where it came from. Uh, because I'm sure if you've seen the paintings, and I know most of those of you who are here tonight have, might want to know what, where they came from. And they came from lots of different places. And I wouldn't entirely agree with Mike that the meaning comes after the work, but I think that the meaning comes before, during, and after the work in a sort of strange kind of way. And one of the things that fascinates me about it is how the process works. For instance, the first siren thing is at Brunenberg last spring, Sita Durakovitz, the director of the program, had given a lecture uh, on sirens, on these double-tailed ladies, as I call them, these double-tailed mermaids and was in, had explored with his class the imagery of what that meant. And traditionally, if you think about it, uh, sirens or mermaids uh, have the implication of being sexually uh, alluring, uh, seductive to men, and dangerous to men. And that they're also seen as, in mermaid stories, as tragic in their love story. They fall in love with a human man, uh, maybe are able to go around without their tail for a while and then are forced to return to their true nature to the sea. And in all of these, the story has to do with their relationship to men and has to do with them as a, usually as a sexual object and a destructive one at that. And I only came up with this idea tonight, so that shows you where some of this comes from. But I had the notion, as I thought about what I was going to say, that for me, I wanted to take the passive part and the desire part and turn it into what I might call active desire. 
So the, the woman in this situation, or the man, this could be either, uh, wants something passionately, and maybe use sexuality as a metaphor for that, but not, act not as a uh, passive situation, but actively wanting something to change. Anyway, after I uh, heard about the lecture, I found out that Cesar had written his PhD dissertation on uh, sirens and mermaids, beginning with the Odyssey. If you remember, the sirens lured Odysseus' his ship, uh, asking them, asking guests to say to the time and flash to the mass that he would not be tempted and had to clip their ears so they would not be carried off of uh, their course. Uh, all the way to Shakespeare, and there are instant instances of sirens in literature all the way from, from uh, the Odyssey to Shakespeare. And then, of course, as soon as I read this, I started seeing sirens everywhere. So I came back from Italy with a notebook full of drawings of sirens, uh, with lots of drawings and images of Renaissance art, and with a very peculiar, serendipitous thing that I found, which was a seahorse. 